Welcome to the Lansdowne Bible Study for the 23rd of March, 2021. Picking up again in our series of studies on the book of 2 Peter, and we have reached chapter 3. In the newsletter, I announced that we will be going from verse 1 to verse 10. But having now finished preparing, I realised that was a bit ambitious. So we're going from verse 1 to verse 7. So 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7. Let's hear God's word. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the prediction of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you today. We pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to give us understanding of your word, to give us a heart to respond to your word. Father, we know that we are tempted so much to be people tied to this earth. But Father, we know even from what we've just read that this current world is passing away. So teach us to keep our eyes upon you. Teach us to live in this world as those ready, passing, ready for glory, passing through, but shining forth the light of the gospel. Lord, we need your help both to understand and to obey. So fill us with your spirit. Enable me to be clear in my explanation of this passage and do us good for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. In my old job as an auditor, I was auditing a government department in quite an old and grimy building. Then for a few days there was huge activity cleaning, polishing and washing every single little corner because the Queen was coming. The second coming of our Lord Jesus is infinitely more important than that event. It is our hope and our joy and scripture calls us to be ready. But as we face day-to-day -day life of living, of working, of making ends meet, of facing the problems of life, of sorrows, discouragement, of the, the heartache that we've been through, many of us, in the last year, of seeking to pay bills, of concern about our family and our home, of having enough to put food on the table and pay the bills. All these things can 
cause us to lose sight of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It seems so far away. Now, in that time in my old job, I couldn't sit around for those that week or so of cleaning and planning and ordering and organising for the coming of the Queen. But yet, the coming of the Queen to that building affected everything. It affected where I could go, who I could talk to, where I could put my papers, because everything had to be ready. In the same way, we don't sit around doing nothing while we're waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. We are called to live for his glory. We are called to work. We are called to witness. We are called to pray. We are called to worship, to do all the things of life, to bring up our children, to honour our parents, to serve our neighbours, to be involved in our communities. All of these things continue. It's a mistake to shut ourselves away and wait for the second coming of Jesus. Nonetheless, the second coming of Jesus should affect everything. It influences all that we are and do. The second coming of Christ, I'm told, I haven't actually counted myself, but I'm told the second coming of Jesus is mentioned around 300 times in the New Testament. It is explicitly mentioned in all but four books of the New Testament, and even in two of those other four, it's at least alluded to. The second coming of Christ is infinitely important. We have a glorious hope to look forward to, which brings perspective to the suffering and trouble in our lives. And we have things to get ready. We have to get ourselves ready. And we have to prepare the way through warning of others. And 2 Peter 3 covers these things. Now, in verse 1 uh, of chapter 3, Peter says, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you. He's referring back, as we've seen already, to 1 Peter or 1 Peter. And there he spoke about trials, persecution and purity. He showed them how to live for God's glory as citizens of God's kingdom in an ungodly society, as spouses in an ungodly family as church members serving each other, as being humble before the Lord, even though the devil is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The main emphasis, as we've said before, was physical persecution. In 2 Peter, the main emphasis is false teaching. It can also lead us away and discourage us in the things of God. And in chapter 1, he laid the foundation of true teaching. So we have that great assurance and that great comfort of what the gospel really is. And then we spend a couple of sessions on Chapter 2, looking at false teaching, actually three sessions, false teaching, what, what they teach, what they're like, and what their final destination is. And then now we are in chapter 3, which looks at the second coming of Jesus. I want to point out to you two verses, one from each of the books. 1 Peter, first of all, 1 Peter 1 and verse 5, who says, who, speaking about us, who are kept sorry, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So Christ is coming and the fullness of salvation is revealed when he comes. And we are kept or guarded through persecution and false teaching. And then in 2 Peter 
chapter 2 and verse 9. It says the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials. The Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials. He knows how to keep us until Christ's coming. He knows how to keep us through Christ's coming so that we are welcomed into his eternal presence. We enjoy the fullness of our salvation in the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. So over the next two or possibly three studies, we're going to look at how the second coming of Christ affects us today. Even though we have still have many things to do in our lives, the second coming of Christ affects us today. Now, the next study will actually be in four weeks' time, as in two weeks' time, I'm on leave. So part one today, part two in four weeks' time, and maybe part three after that, but we'll see how we go. So what then is the impact of the second coming of Christ on our lives right now? Firstly, the second coming of Christ calls us to stand upon God's word. Verse 1, chapter 3, 2 Peter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. That's an encouragement. Peter writes to his uh, 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 be beloved fellow believers, but it's also a reminder that we are beloved of God. God the Father loved us. Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. The Holy Spirit in love indwells, empowers us. We are loved of God. And then he says, in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. And that is also encouraging. The, the NIV translates this uh, about in motivating us to um, wholesome thinking. Yes, it's true that the word of God does motivate us to wholesome thinking. The word of God does renew our minds, but that's actually not what Peter's saying here. He says we have a sincere mind. When you are born again, your dead inner self became alive and that has affected your mind so that when you receive the word of God it has an effect your mind which has been renewed already it has become sincere it has become free from alloy it is not corrupted it's not perfect yet which is why it needs to go on being renewed but you are able, if you're a Christian, to receive the word of God. And that is fantastic news that you you might not have a whole lot of deg degrees. You might not be the uh, even think you have the ability to answer those who say, uh, verse four, where is the promise of his coming? Those who criticise and mock us today, you may not have a great level of intellectual intelligence, but you have a new mind and you are able to receive the word of God. And that is fantastic news. Now, Peter's already spoken about reminding us back in chapter 1 and verse 13. I think it is right, it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. There it's about growing in godliness and, and standing in the gospel and being assured of our, that, that, that more sure word, the word of God. And here it says, verse 2, that you should remember, this is chapter 3, verse 2, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. He's drawing attention here to the word of God, Old Testament, 
and the word of God through the Lord Jesus and then shared by the apostles. The word of God, Old and New Testaments. The word of God which we have today. The word of God which, for example, in the Old Testament, in Joel chapter 2, said, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming near. And the words of the Lord Jesus himself in Mark chapter 13 and verse 33. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And that's a call to us. We stay awake. Notice that idea of what it says about being stirred up, stirring up, awakening your minds, awakening you to the truth. And that's why we stand on the word of God. A sure way to sleep spiritually is to keep our Bibles closed. So we need to be stirred up by the word of God so that we are ready for his coming. The pressures of life dull our spiritual senses. Disappointments and, and fears uh, discourage us. And the word of God refreshes and revives us. Indeed, the whole word of God does. Notice here it talks about the holy prophets, the apostles and the command of the Lord and Saviour. Often we have Bibles with words in red as if to suggest that the words of Jesus are somehow more authoritative than the rest of the Bible. No, the words of the holy prophets, the words of the apostles, indeed the whole of the Bible is the word of our Lord and Saviour and therefore is to obey, be obeyed. And so we need this word to stir us up, to awaken us from sleep, Especially because we, as we look to the second coming, stand out from the world. So the second coming demands we become a people of the word. We stand on the word. But the second coming also causes us to stand out from the world. It's very interesting. Verse 3 does not give a road map of the coming of Jesus. You can read books or watch YouTube videos which will give great big charts about this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. Peter does not do that because it's more important to be ready than to have all the answers about the timing and how Christ will come. In fact, Godly Christians disagree on some of the details of that. And so the urgent thing is not to be uh, immersing ourselves in detail, but to be ready and to be warned that while we wait, there is a battle on. So Jesus, Peter says, knowing this, first of all, you need to remember before anything else, the reality that you are going to be attacked. You are going to be mocked. And he's warning us out of love. When you become a, became a Christian, life did not get easier. In fact, life got harder because people thought you were crazy. Your family thought you'd lost the plot. Your friends perhaps didn't want to be with you so much because you weren't carrying on the way you used to before because you had been changed. And in relation to the second coming specifically, 
The world thinks it's a joke, but it will never happen. How can it happen? It's been 2000 years and it's tempting because it has been 2000 years to be like the world and assume that everything will carry on as it always has. But in verse 3, we see the reason for the world's mocking. It says right at the end there, following their own sinful desires. Opposition to the gospel, opposition to the idea of an end to the world, a coming of Christ, a final judgment, may sound intellectual because it's often brought by intellectual people called professor so-and-so or doctor so-and-so but at the heart of the opposition to the coming of Christ is our own sinful desires because sin doesn't want judgment we like to live the way we live without any accountability to God. If there's a judgment, that demands change. And so it's easier, even though it might be dressed up in clever language, it's easier to oppose the coming of Christ and even to suggest that there is no God than actually to change, to repent, to turn to Jesus. The implication of where is the promise is well if there is a promise there's no god anyway because it can't be true or if there is a god he's not really interested in this world and so i can live the way i want the language from the beginning um, of creation at the end of verse four reflects a worldview of peter's day most people believe creation had a beginning not everybody did but a lot of people did believe that that there was some kind of beginning to creation, but they didn't believe that there was an all-sovereign, personal, holy, almighty, eternal, single God who had created everything out of nothing. And today people might say, oh yeah, the universe began with a big bang. But there's no personal, eternal God who brought everything into being and sustains everything by his word. People might talk about the laws of science or the laws of nature, but essentially they do not believe there is a eternal God to whom they must give an account. And therefore they must believe in order to keep their consciences at bay that there is no second coming. And there is no final judgment. And if we are to stand in the face of this opposition, then we need, yes, to be a people of the word, but not just people of the word, a people who see the world through the lens of scripture. I am looking into the lens of a camera right now. And so you see me with all my lengthening hair, and perhaps I've missed a bit when I've been shaving, you see all of that through the lens of a camera. They say the camera doesn't lie. Well, maybe it does or it doesn't. But the one thing that doesn't lie is the word of God. And they say, verse 4, it's all gone on the same since creation. Has it? Well, the word of God tells us it hasn't. The world tells us that the universe came into existence through a random event called a Big Bang. And if that is true, then we are just random events brought about by evolution. And so we have no worth and we can do what we want to do. There's no accountability, no judgment in the world's view because there is no God and no rules. So we can live for the here and now. But this is not what God says. I was read a story the other day about a tourist in Ireland 
who was lost and they saw a farmer and they went up to the farmer and said, how do I get to this place? And the farmer said, and I won't do the accent, the farmer said, if you want to get there, I wouldn't start from here. The world wants peace and security, but if it wants those things, it can't start from where they are right now. It needs to start, and if we want to grow and be secure as we wait for Christ's coming, we need to start with the Word of God. The Word of God reveals the world had a beginning. So it says, verse 5, they deliberately overlook, and this shows it's a choice. They deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And so if we turn to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis and chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That's why Peter refers to waters in chapter three and verse five. Uh, and God said, Genesis one, three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then further on, it says, verse 10, the waters were gathered. He called them seas and God called the dry land earth. So this is the, the picture that Peter is, 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 is basing. This is the, 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 the account that Peter is basing his explanation on. God made the universe. But not only that, he is the one who intervenes. And it says, um, verse six and by that means and that means is the word of God and the water of the original creation uh, first back to verse five and by that means but and that by means of these the word sorry the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished He's referring, of course, to the days of Noah. Now, God's intervened at other times in creation, but the day of Noah was the most catastrophic and prefigures the final judgment because it affects, or affected rather, the whole earth. It affected the whole earth. And today, as in Noah's day, people pretend there's nothing happening, nothing really to worry about. And so in uh, Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. They ignored Noah's preaching then. And people today are saying it's not going to happen. But saying it's not going to happen, being unaware that it will happen, will not stop the coming judgment of God. And that is Peter's reasoning. So therefore, verse 7, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So all the arguments of the world of Peter's day, of the world of today, that says, well, it's all going to just carry on the same, it always has done, is looking through the wrong lens. It's starting from the wrong point. We need to start from the word of God. That is our starting point. And the word of God says, God made the universe. God has intervened in the universe. And therefore God has the right and power to end the universe. 
This is very important. This is why the second coming affects everything for us as believers also. The world will not remain forever. It's easy to get attached to this world and live as if it will keep going on without end. Now, of course, it's not wrong to plan for the future. It's not wrong to be concerned about our children and our families. But they, those things should not consume us. We need to hold these things with a light touch. So in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 27, it says, sorry, 1 Corinthians 7, 29, it says, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now, all the things Paul lists here are good and they are important. He's not saying leave your wife or leave your kids, leave your job. These things are valid and important and should be, you, you should live if you're married, if you're working in a way in these things that honours God. But he's saying these things are not our final authority. Your God is not your wife or your husband or your children or your job or your home or your phone or your car or any other things. The Lord Almighty is God. And these things, all these things, even the good things are passing away. And we live for Christ and his coming. And all these things will be passing away. It says about fire and the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. In Noah's day, the world of sinful man was destroyed. But the structure of the world, the world itself remained. But when the final judgment comes, the fire of God will come through the whole of creation. And there will be, as we read in 2 Peter 3 and verse 13, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's a glorious hope for the Christian. But it is also a terrible warning for the unbeliever. And while I will say more about this next time, because there's not time now to continue through the rest of the chapter. These sobering truths about the, 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 the fact this creation will come to an end and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and that there will be a judgment, it says, a judgment and destruction of the ungodly that that is sobering because we must pray and witness as well as comforting that as we live in an ungodly world with so much trouble that this world is not my home that there is a coming of Jesus and there is a new heaven and a new earth and this sorrow and suffering is but for a moment. As we saw on Sunday, in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the truth, brothers and sisters. But notice also, and this is important as we begin to draw this study to a close. Notice the centrality in Verses five to seven of God's word. Creation is by the word of God. End of verse five. The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. The flood 
as we've mentioned already, is that by means of these. Now, the these, the NIV says by means of water. That's not actually what the, the, the connection is. Yes, water was involved. That's why it says these by means of water, but also by means of the word of God. It was by God's word that the heavens opened and the the all the underground springs and everything burst forth and the rain fell and the floods rose and the earth was flooded it is by God's word. And then it says, verse seven, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment. So the world, the world, the creation exists now because of the word of God and is being preserved until the day of judgment. Now, next time we'll see why the world is being preserved. We, we, that's spoken about in verses in chapter three and verse nine of two Peter, why God is delaying. But the fact is that the word of God sustains the world. So in Hebrews one and verse three, it says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So the word sustains, God's word sustains the universe. And according to his word, according to his promise, verse nine, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. Verse 13, according to his promise, we are waiting for a for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So there is his promise by that word at just the right time, Christ will return and by his word, the universe will be dissolved. One of the people just after the, the next generation from the uh, apostles, a guy called Clement, says this, by a word of his majesty, he created the universe and by a word, he can destroy it. Such is the power of his word. No wonder it says in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2, which I haven't marked, so I need to find it in my Bible, Isaiah 66 and verse 2. It says, all these things my hand has made. And so all these things come, came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. He is such an awesome God. His word is so powerful to create, to intervene, to sustain, to judge, to promise, to bring to pass the new heavens and the new earth. So powerful is his word how worthy he is to receive our obedience and our worship. And yet, how good he is. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth. Again, that's his word. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like, like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news 
that was preached to you. This word is the good news that was preached to you. This same word that created the universe, if you're a Christian, that same word has been implanted within you by the Holy Spirit. That same word of promise keeps you an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's his word that revives us. Psalm 119 verse 25 in the New King James says, Revive me according to your word. And also Psalm 119 but verse 130 says, The unfolding of your word gives light. His word saved you. His word sustains you. His word revives you. His word guides you. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming. His timing is not ours. Yes, there is a delay. And we'll see more of why next time. But he's not left us alone. He is with us by his spirit. He is, as Peter tells us in chapter one, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's granted us his precious and very great promises and he's given us his word let's stir up our minds and lives by his word let's not sleep or drift let's worship him for the saving power of Jesus revealed to us by his word and the power of his word by which we were born again let's look at the world through his eyes and not our own. Let's examine our lives in the light of his word because this world is not forever. Let's encourage ourselves by the promises of his word and let's share the word of his gospel and pray his word. Let's pray. Father, help us to be ready for Christ's coming. Help us to stand on your word. Help us to see the world through your eyes, through the lens of scripture. And help us, Lord God, to live your word in these days. And we pray that you would use us to bring many people to yourself. Comfort, encourage us, revive us, guide us. Refresh us through your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just some pointers for prayer. Pray that the Lord would help us to be a people of his word. And that he would protect us from being carried away by the prevailing opinions of the world around Ask the Lord to help you to live in the light of his coming, to live godly so that we are ever ready for him to return. Pray for the return of face to face services, for all the practical arrangements to go well, for safety, but above all for great joy in his presence and for his word to go out with power. Pray that we would see a return of visitors to our services and that the online messages would reach more and more people. Ask for opportunities to share your faith this Easter. Pray for our nation. Pray for deliverance from unbelief. Pray that God would use these days to turn people around that he would send a mighty revival and that many would be saved and continue to pray for the health and provision and encouragement and comfort of the local church and all of God's people. The Lord bless you in abundance and thank you for listening.